Oh, okay, great. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Baer, and I am a microbiology reviewer in the Division of Microbiology Assessment, or DMA, at CEDAR. Um, I was looking at last year's presentation from a colleague of mine, and I think it gave a really great foundation for what we are looking for, looking at in um, your applications. And I thought, how can I build on her presentation? So. What I thought I'd do today is uh, give you some insight into a DMA assessment of Ananda. What we assess, what we are looking for, and what issues we frequently find with applications. In DMA, we're looking at the microbiology quality assessment aspects, or quality um, aspects of your product. This includes assessing the manufacturing process, including any validation studies supporting the sterility assurance of your product, and the microbial process controls. This would include things like the bioburden testing, filter integrity testing, and environmental monitoring. The manufacturing process and the microbial process controls that we need to look at because we need to determine whether the applicant is capable of producing a drug product that meets the finished product quality attributes. These attributes include things like sterility, endotoxins, container closure integrity. So that is what we assess. And now I'd like to provide you with some practical information about what we are looking for in your application and how to prepare your application for efficient assessment. We would like to approve every application that we receive, but in order to do so, we need to determine whether the application is accessible. We are basing that determination on the information that you provide to us. If the information is missing or difficult to find or understand, um, it makes this assessment much less efficient. And so as I have here, if the assessor has to search for or request information, the assessor becomes more like a detective, and the assessment efficiency might be impacted. So we are looking to understand your proposed commercial manufacturing process and how your validation studies support your capability to produce the drug product. To do this, there is some basic information that we need and can sometimes be missing or difficult to find in the application. Some examples of this are very basic information. What equipment are you going to use for production, commercial production? Uh, what is your manufacturing area? What filling line will you be using? What are the room numbers for the location of things like autoclaves, tunnels, et cetera? What are your validation and production parameters and loads? So for an autoclave, you may be using a certain set of parameters for production, but then you've validated using a different set. So we need to understand those things. Then we also need to understand your validation approach. So are you using production loads and parameters, worst case loads parameters, or maybe you're using a bracketing strategy? This is important for us to understand in order to make our determination that your study is acceptable. So this basic information can be provided in an introduction to your validation study. And it's helpful to do this because it provides the assessor with a framework for understanding your validation. So tell us how the validation supports commercial production. An example of this kind of introduction is provided here. So at the beginning of your validation study, you could say, Autoclave X was qualified by performing three empty chamber heat distribution runs and three worst case heat penetration BI challenge runs in 2016. The worst case load covers all loads proposed for production. 
So this is great because it tells us specifically what equipment you're looking at, what the validation study entailed, when it was performed, and what your validation strategy is. In this case, a worst case load strategy. So once we understand the validation strategy, we then need to make a determination that the validation data is acceptable. So if the relevant data is difficult to find, this makes this assessment more difficult. Sometimes, for example, we see very long reports containing difficult to read handwritten notebook pages and unrelated validation studies. This is more difficult to assess than a validation report that clearly summarizes the data in tables for just the relevant loads. So for example, for an autoclave study, we might look at uh, the temperatures achieved, the lethality achieved, and the BI challenge results. That's put together in a clear table telling us how it relates to your uh, commercial production, then that is much easier to assess. Some of the information that we assess doesn't come directly from the ANDA. The ANDA applicant may be relying on a drug master file for some of the information regarding their manufacturing process. The drug master file, or DMF, can often be more difficult to assess than the ANDA. There are several reasons for this. Um, one is that many DMFs are only available as paper copies that have to be requested from the document room. So this is a source of delay. And then um, the DMF may be uh, covering multiple manufacturing processes that are not related to you, your process. Um, and it can also be poorly organized, unfortunately. So I think um, what I would say is that one way to address this and make our, efficient, our assessment more efficient is to provide a letter of authorization, or LOA, that specifically states where the relevant validation information is for us to assess. So you would tell us in the LOA the submission date we should look at, and things like the section and the page numbers within that submission. That greatly helps us focus our assessment. We're looking forward to May when all new DMF submissions are required to be submitted electronically. So we anticipate that this will be helpful for our assessment because we will have maybe more immediate access to the information and potentially it will be faster to assess. Another option um, to be aware of is that you may be able to provide the information from the third party directly in your ANDA. So if the third party vendor is willing to provide you with that information for submission. Now I'd like to um, focus my talk on a few topics that are commonly lead to deficiencies. And these topics relate to the validation of pre-sterilized equipment media fill process simulations, drug product endotoxins testing, and extended storage times following reconstitution and dilution of the drug product. So the first topic is validation of pre-sterilized equipment. So sometimes an applicant may be using a filter or a holding bag that they purchased sterile from another vendor. Um, but often we don't actually have that information in the application. They may fail to tell, that, tell us that they're using this pre-sterilized filter and they won't, provide, won't have provided the sterilization validation information. So um, this can make it a problem because when we're looking at your application, we need to also under, know and understand how the sterilization of this filter or holding bag is being performed. So clearly mention the use of pre-sterilized equipment in your application. And indicate the party responsible 
for sterilization of the system. And then if you're sterilizing it as well, let's say you're including your filter that's purchased sterile in an autoclave load, tell us, because that can focus our assessment. And then if you need to, you would reference the DMF or provide the sterilization validation information in your ANDA if the vendor is willing to give you that information. So the value in doing this is that you can avoid deficiency concerning the content of equipment loads or which equipment is included in a SIP validation. So if we don't see a, a load that has a filter, we'll have to ask you for it. And then um, you might have to go through a couple IRs to get that information to us. And sometimes we'll see things in an autoclave study where it says, a worst case load is used. So that's good for telling us what your validation approach is, but it isn't descriptive enough for us to really know what is included in the load. So then we'll ask and IRs will have to be sent. Another validation study that often leads to deficiencies is the media fill process simulation. <clears throat> Here we really need to understand how your media fill simulation uh, simulates your aseptic process. And we want to have a detailed description of both. So we can compare how your media fill simulation is, what those conditions are to what you plan to do for production. So describe how the media fill conditions simulate production or worst case process. And here the benefit is, is by providing this information, you can avoid simple deficiencies requesting things like the maximum filling duration for your simulation or process, um, the filling speed used for production and the simulation, what interventions were used, and what container was used for the media fill simulation. Another type of validation that can be confusing to applicants uh, is related to drug product endotoxins testing and the impact that pooling samples has on the maximum valid dilution. So pooling samples results in additional dilution equal to the number of pooled samples should only one sample exceed the endotoxins limit. For example, you may be pooling three samples taken from the beginning, middle, and end of your fill and then determining um, you know, the endotoxins, uh, whether it passes your endotoxin specification. Pooling is acceptable, but you need to take into account that the MVD should be adjusted to a proportionally lower value. So in the case I described, where you have three samples, you would adjust the MVD by delay, dividing the MVD by three. And this is important because you need to ensure that your test method is able to overcome potential product-related interference or enhancement. And if you haven't taken account this additional dilution, you may not be within the adjusted MVD. Okay, the final topic that I'd like to discuss today relates to the storage of uh, the drug product following reconstitution and dilution. In this case, let's say you had a lyophilized drug product that gets reconstituted with a specific diluent and then potentially further diluted. And the package insert will give the instructions for this reconstitution and dilution using specific diluents and storage temperatures and um, storage periods. And we need to understand what the potential is for growth of navintitious microbial contamination during that uh, post-constitution and post-dilution storage period. And frequently, frequently we have applications that lack microbiological studies in support of the post-constitution and post-dilution storage time. So one way to address this is to provide a risk assessment, including microbiology challenge study data to support the post-penetration holding parameters um, in order to demonstrate that the final solutions do not support microbial growth during the specified storage period. 
provided on this slide is a potential study design that you might uh, consider. So first you would inoculate the final drug solution. This would be the reconstituted and potentially diluted solution. With a minimum countable inoculum, let's say one, less than 100 CFU per mil of challenge organisms. The organisms might be the compendial USP51 organisms or psychrophilic organisms or organisms associated with nosocomial infections. You would then uh, incubate that inoculated solution for the storage, at the storage temperatures specified in the package insert. Then you would sample at the specified storage times as well as at intermediate and extended storage times. This is so we'd like to see if you can observe a growth trend during that time period. And growth is generally accepted as population increases of greater than one half log base 10. By providing us this information, we can better understand the risk associated with the product labeling with regard to in-use stability and or uh, diluent compatibility claims. So taken together, uh, the issues I've highlighted can really be addressed by making the information easy to understand, logical, and simple to assess, and by avoiding common deficiencies for basic information. But thank you for your attention. I've included my information here if you'd like to contact me. Also included in my slides is our um, information about how to submit controlled correspondence if you have questions about generic drug development, and several references that will give you more information about these topics and the expectations FDA has for your application. Thank you.